This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Michael Scherer. Typee by Herman Melville. Chapter 14. In the course of a few days, Toby had recovered from the effects of his adventure with the Hapar warriors the wound on his head rapidly healing under the vegetable treatment of the good Tenor. Less fortunate than my companion, however, I still continued to languish under a complaint the origin and nature of which were still a mystery. Cut off as I was from all intercourse with the civilized world, and feeling the inefficiency of anything the natives could do to relieve me, knowing too that so long as I remained in my present condition it would be impossible for me to leave the valley, whatever opportunity might present itself, and apprehensive that ere long we might be exposed to some caprice on the part of the islanders, I now gave up all hopes of recovery, and became a prey to the most gloomy thoughts. A deep dejection fell upon me, which neither the friendly remonstrances of my companion, the devoted attentions of Kori Kori, nor all the soothing influences of Fayaway could remove. One morning, as I lay on the mats in the house, plunged in melancholy reverie, and regardless of everything around me, Toby, who had left me about an hour, returned in haste, and with great glee told me to cheer up and be of good heart, for he believed, from what was going on among the natives, that there were boats approaching the bay. These tidings operated upon me like magic. The hour of our deliverance was at hand, and starting up I was soon convinced that something unusual was about to occur. The word, Boti, Boti, was vociferated in all directions, and shouts were heard in the distance, at first feebly and faintly, but growing louder and nearer at each successive repetition, until they were caught up by a fellow in a coconut tree a few yards off, who, sounding them in turn, they were reiterated from a neighboring grove, and so died away gradually from point to point, as the intelligence penetrated into the farthest recesses of the valley. This was the vocal telegraph of the islanders, by means of which condensed items of information could be carried in a very few minutes from the sea to their remotest habitation, a distance of at least eight or nine miles. On the present occasion it was in active operation, one piece of information following another with inconceivable rapidity. The greatest commotion now appeared to prevail. At every fresh item of intelligence, the natives betrayed the liveliest interest, and redoubled the energy with which they employed themselves in collecting fruit to sell to the expected visitors. Some were tearing off the husks from coconuts, some perched in the trees were throwing down breadfruit to their companions, who gathered them into heaps as they fell while others were plying their fingers rapidly in weaving leafen baskets in which to carry the fruit. There were other matters, too, going on at the same time. Here you would see a stout warrior polishing his spear with a bit of old tapa, or adjusting the folds of the girdle about his waist, and there you might descry a young damsel decorating herself with flowers, as if having in her eyes some maidenly conquest while, as in all cases of hurry and confusion in every part of the world, a number of individuals kept hurrying to and fro, with amazing vigor and perseverance, doing nothing themselves, and hindering others. Never before had we seen the islanders in such a state of bustle and excitement, and the scene furnished abundant evidence of the fact that it was only at long intervals any such events occur. When I thought of the length of time that might intervene before a similar chance of escape would be presented, I bitterly lamented that I had not the power of availing myself effectually of the present opportunity. From all that we could gather, it appeared that the natives were fearful of arriving too late upon the beach, unless they made extraordinary exertions. Sick and lame as I was, I would have started with Toby at once, had not Cory Cory not only refused to carry me, but manifested the most invincible repugnance to our leaving the neighborhood of the house. The rest of the savages were equally opposed to our wishes, and seemed grieved and astonished at the earnestness of my solicitations. I clearly perceived that while my attendant avoided all appearance of constraining my movements, he was nevertheless determined to thwart my wish. 
He seemed to me on this particular occasion, as well as often afterwards, to be executing the orders of some other person with regard to me, though at the same time feeling towards me the most lively affection. Toby, who had made up his mind to accompany the islanders if possible, as soon as they were in readiness to depart, and who for that reason had refrained from showing the same anxiety that I had done, now represented to me that it was idle for me to entertain the hope of reaching the beach in time to profit by any opportunity that might then be presented. "'Do you not see?' said he. "'The savages themselves are fearful of being too late, and I should hurry forward myself at once. Did I not think that if I showed too much eagerness I should destroy all our hopes of reaping any benefit from this fortunate event?' If you will only endeavor to appear tranquil or unconcerned, you will quiet their suspicions, and I have no doubt they will then let me go with them to the beach, supposing that I merely go out of curiosity. Should I succeed in getting down to the boats, I will make known the condition in which I have left you, and measures may then be taken to secure our escape. In the expediency of this I could not but acquiesce, and as the natives had now completed their preparations, I watched with the liveliest interest the reception that Toby's application might meet with. As soon as they understood from my companion that I intended to remain, they appeared to make no objection to his proposition, and even hailed it with pleasure. Their singular conduct on this occasion not a little puzzled me at the time, and imparted to subsequent events an additional mystery. The islanders were now to be seen hurrying along the path which led to the sea, I shook Toby warmly by the hand, and gave him my peta hat to shield his wounded head from the sun, as he had lost his own. He cordially returned the pressure of my hand, and solemnly promising to return as soon as the boats should leave the shore, sprang from my side, and the next minute disappeared in a turn of the grove. In spite of the unpleasant reflections that crowded upon my mind, I could not but be entertained by the novel and animated sight which now met my view. One after another the natives crowded along the narrow path, laden with every variety of fruit. Here you might have seen one, who, after ineffectually endeavoring to persuade a surly porker to be conducted in leading strings, was obliged at last to seize the perverse animal in his arms, and carry him struggling against his naked breast, and squealing without intermission. There went two, who, at a little distance, might have been taken for the Hebrew spies on their return to Moses with the goodly bunch of grapes. One trotted before the other at a distance of a couple of yards, while between them, from a pole resting on their shoulders, was suspended a huge cluster of bananas, which swayed to and fro with a rocking gait at which they proceeded. Here ran another, perspiring with his exertions, and bearing before him a quantity of coconuts, who, fearful of being too late, heeded not the fruit that dropped from his basket, and appeared solely intent upon reaching his destination, careless how many of his coconuts kept company with him. In a short time the last straggler was seen hurrying on his way, and the faint shouts of those in advance died insensibly upon the ear. Our part of the valley now appeared nearly deserted by its inhabitants. Cory Cory, his aged father, and a few decrepit old people being all that were left. Towards sunset, the islanders in small parties began to return from the beach, and among them, as they drew near to the house, I sought to descry the form of my companion. But one after another they passed the dwelling, and I caught no glimpse of him. Supposing, however, that he would soon appear with some of the members of the household, I quieted my apprehensions and waited patiently to see him advancing in company with the beautiful Fayaway. At last I perceived Tenor coming forward, followed by the girls and young men who usually resided in the house of Marheo. But with them came not my comrade, and, filled with a thousand alarms, I eagerly sought to discover the cause of his delay. My earnest questions appeared to embarrass the natives greatly. All their accounts were contradictory, one giving me to understand that Toby would be with me in a very short time, another that he did not know where he was, while a third, violently inveighing against him, assured me that he had stolen away and would never come back. 
it appeared to me at the time that in making these various statements they endeavored to conceal from me some terrible disaster, lest the knowledge of it should overpower me. Fearful lest some fatal calamity had overtaken him, I sought out young Fayaway, and endeavored to learn from her, if possible, the truth. This gentle being had early attracted my regard, not only from her extraordinary beauty, but from the attractive cast of her countenance, singularly expressive of intelligence and humanity. Of all the natives, she alone seemed to appreciate the effect which the peculiarity of the circumstances in which we were placed had produced upon the minds of my companion and myself. In addressing me, especially when I lay reclining upon the mats, suffering from pain, there was a tenderness in her manner which it was impossible to misunderstand or resist. Whenever she entered the house, the expression of her face indicated the liveliest sympathy for me, and moving towards the place where I lay, with one arm slightly elevated in a gesture of pity, and her large glistening eyes gazing intently into mine, she would murmur plaintively, Oha, oha, tamo, and seat herself mournfully beside me. Her manner convinced me that she deeply compassionated my situation, as being removed from my country and friends, and placed beyond the reach of all relief. Indeed, at times I was almost led to believe that her mind was swayed by gentle impulses hardly to be anticipated from one in her condition, that she appeared to be conscious there were ties rudely severed, which had once bound us to our homes that there were sisters and brothers anxiously looking forward to our return, who were, perhaps, never more to behold us. In this amiable light did Fayaway appear in my eyes, and reposing full confidence in her candor and intelligence, I now had recourse to her, in the midst of my alarm, with regard to my companion. My questions evidently distressed her. She looked round from one to another of the bystanders, as if hardly knowing what answer to give me. At last, yielding to my importunities, she overcame her scruples, and gave me to understand that Toby had gone away with the boats which had visited the bay, but had promised to return at the expiration of three days. At first I accused him of perfidiously deserting me, but as I grew more composed, I upbraided myself for imputing so cowardly an action to him, and tranquilized myself with the belief that he had availed himself of the opportunity to go round to Nukahiva in order to make some arrangement by which I could be removed from the valley. At any rate, thought I, he will return with the medicines I require, and then, as soon as I recover, there will be no difficulty in the way of our departure. Consoling myself with these reflections, I lay down that night in a happier frame of mind than I had done for some time. The next day passed without any allusion to Toby on the part of the natives, who seemed desirous of avoiding all reference to the subject. This raised some apprehensions in my breast, but when night came I congratulated myself that the second day had now gone by, and that on the morrow Toby would again be with me. But the morrow came and went, and my companion did not appear. Ah, thought I, he reckons three days from the morning of his departure. Tomorrow he will arrive. But that weary day also closed upon me, without his return. Even yet I would not despair. I thought that something detained him, that he was waiting for the sailing of a boat at Nukahiva, and that in a day or two at farthest I should see him again. But day after day of renewed disappointment passed by, at last, hope deserted me, and I fell a victim to despair. Yes, thought I, gloomily, he has secured his own escape, and cares not what calamity may befall his unfortunate comrade. Fool that I was, to suppose that any one would willingly encounter the perils of this valley, after having once got beyond its limits. He has gone, and has left me to combat alone all the dangers by which I am surrounded. Thus would I sometimes seek to derive a desperate consolation from dwelling upon the perfidy of Toby, 
whilst at other times I sunk under the bitter remorse which I felt as having by my own imprudence brought upon myself the fate which I was sure awaited me. At other times I thought that perhaps after all these treacherous savages had made away with him, and thence the confusion into which they were thrown by my questions, and their contradictory answers, or he might be a captive in some other part of the valley, or, more dreadful still, might have met with that fate at which my very soul shuddered. But all these speculations were vain. No tidings of Toby ever reached me. He had gone, never to return. The conduct of the islanders appeared inexplicable. All reference to my lost comrade was carefully evaded, and if at any time they were forced to make some reply to my frequent inquiries on the subject, they would uniformly denounce him as an ungrateful runaway who had deserted his friend and taken himself off to that vile and detestable place, Nukahiva. But whatever might have been his fate, now that he was gone, the natives multiplied their acts of kindness and attention towards myself, treating me with a degree of deference which could hardly have been surpassed had I been some celestial visitant. Cory Cory never for one moment left my side, unless it were to execute my wishes. The faithful fellow, twice every day, in the cool of the morning and in the evening, insisted upon carrying me to the stream and bathing me in its refreshing water. Frequently in the afternoon he would carry me to a particular part of the stream, where the beauty of the scene produced a soothing influence upon my mind. At this place the waters flowed between grassy banks, planted with enormous breadfruit trees, whose vast branches interlacing overhead formed a leafy canopy. Near the stream were several smooth black rocks. One of these, projecting several feet above the surface of the water, had upon its summit a shallow cavity, which, filled with freshly gathered leaves, formed a delightful couch. Here I often lay for hours, covered with a gauze-like veil of tapa, while Fayaway seated beside me, and holding in her hand a fan woven from the leaflets of a young coconut bough, brushed aside the insects that occasionally lighted on my face, and Cory Cory, with a view of chasing away my melancholy, performed a thousand antics in the water before us. As my eye wandered along this romantic stream, it would fall upon the half-immersed figure of a beautiful girl, standing in the transparent water, and catching in a little net a species of diminutive shellfish, of which these people are extravagantly fond. Sometimes a chattering group would be seated upon the edge of a low rock in the midst of the brook, busily engaged in thinning and polishing the shells of coconuts, by rubbing them briskly with a small stone in the water, an operation which soon converts them into a light and elegant drinking vessel, somewhat resembling goblets made of tortoise shell. But the tranquilizing influences of beautiful scenery, and the exhibition of human life under so novel and charming an aspect, were not my only sources of consolation. Every evening, the girls of the house gathered about me on the mats, and after chasing away Cory Cory from my side, who nevertheless retired only to a little distance, and watched their proceedings with the most jealous attention, would anoint my whole body with a fragrant oil, squeezed from a yellow root, previously pounded between a couple of stones, and which in their language is denominated Akka and most refreshing and agreeable are the juices of the akka when applied to one's limbs by the soft palms of sweet nymphs whose bright eyes are beaming upon you with kindness. And I used to hail with delight the daily recurrence of this luxurious operation, in which I forgot all my troubles, and buried for the time every feeling of sorrow. Sometimes in the cool of the evening my devoted servitor would lead me out upon the pee in front of the house, and seating me near its edge, protect my body from the annoyances of the insects which occasionally hovered in the air, by wrapping me round with a large roll of tapa. He then bustled about, and employed himself at least twenty minutes in adjusting everything to secure my personal comfort. Having perfected his arrangements, he would get my pipe, 
and, lighting it, would hand it to me. Often he was obliged to strike a light for the occasion, and as the mode he adopted was entirely different from what I had ever seen or heard of before, I will describe it. A straight, dry, and partly decayed stick of the hibiscus, about six feet in length, and half as many inches in diameter, with a smaller bit of wood not more than a foot long, and scarcely an inch wide, is as invariably to be met with in every house in Taipei as a box of lucifer matches in the corner of a kitchen cupboard at home. The islander, placing the larger stick obliquely against some object, with one end elevated at an angle of forty-five degrees, mounts astride of it like an urchin about to gallop off upon a cane, and then, grasping the smaller one firmly in both hands, he rubs its pointed end slowly up and down the extent of a few inches on the principal stick, until at last he makes a narrow groove in the wood, with an abrupt termination at the point furthest from him, where all the dusty particles which the friction creates are accumulated in a little heap. At first, Cory Cory goes to work quite leisurely, but gradually quickens his pace, and waxing warm in the employment, drives the stick furiously along the smoking channel, plying his hands to and fro with amazing rapidity, the perspiration starting from every pore. As he approaches the climax of his effort, he pants and gasps for breath, and his eyes almost start from their sockets with the violence of his exertions. This is the critical stage of the operation. All his previous labors are vain if he cannot sustain the rapidity of the movement until the reluctant spark is produced. Suddenly, he stops, becomes perfectly motionless. His hands still retain their hold of the smaller stick, which is pressed convulsively against the further end of the channel among the fine powder there accumulated, as if he had just pierced through and through some little viper that was wriggling and struggling to escape from his clutches. The next moment, a delicate wreath of smoke curls spirally into the air. The heap of dusty particles glows with fire, and Cory Cory, almost breathless, dismounts from his steed. This operation appeared to me to be the most laborious species of work performed in Taipei, and had I possessed a sufficient intimacy with the language to have conveyed my ideas upon the subject, I should certainly have suggested to the most influential of the natives the expediency of establishing a college of vestals to be centrally located in the valley, for the purpose of keeping alive the indispensable article of fire, so as to supersede the necessity of such a vast outlay of strength and good temper as were usually squandered on these occasions. There might, however, be special difficulties in carrying this plan into execution. What a striking evidence does this operation furnish of the wide difference between the extreme of savage and civilized life. A gentleman of Taipei can bring up a numerous family of children, and give them all a highly respectable cannibal education, with infinitely less toil and anxiety than he expends in the simple process of striking a light. Whilst a poor European artisan, who, through the instrumentality of a lucifer, performs the same operation in one second, is put to his wit's end to provide for his starving offspring that food which the children of a Polynesian father, without troubling their parent, pluck from the branches of every tree around them.